Hello there and a very warm welcome to you on this second series of Lockdown Lowdown. Thank you to everyone who commented and messaged in to say how much you enjoyed the first series and so due to popular demand I'm back again with a second series. Just like last time I will be joined by some amazing and super talented individuals with fascinating stories. If you're not part of my YouTube family, you're very welcome to be. So go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And while you're at it, why not hit the bell sign too? So you can get regular notifications every time a new episode is out. If you enjoy the episode, do go ahead and give it a like and support the channel by sharing it. I'm delighted to be joined very shortly by our first guest, a talented musician and speaker with a heart of gold. He was part of Ireland's popular band, the DL Runners, and check this out, the 20th century Fox movie, The Commitments, was based on their story. Isn't that cool? And if that wasn't enough, he's multi-talented and was also quite the footballer as in soccer player too. Well, today he's better known as Pastor Pat after a series of coincidental, I think not, experiences all aligned to help him see life in a whole different way. A true family man with a beautiful family and a wonderful church family in Dublin. Patrick Fitzgerald joins me for this episode of Lockdown Lowdown. Here he comes. Great to be here, Bev. Great to see you again, my friend. Likewise, likewise. You're kicking off our second series here. So, oh, wow. Uh, so much to talk about today. Um, yeah. So let's get straight into it. No problem. So, right away. We'll start off with your band, the DL Runners. Gosh, yes. how interesting. Um, so you guys were described as a pop funk group, so we'll, yeah. we'll come, we'll come yeah. back to that in a moment. Um, but you've also been compared to the likes of U2 and Sinead O'Connor, which is yeah. really cool. Um, and what I particularly find interesting is the fact that you were a mixed band, so a mix of genders, there were guys and there were girls as well. And the commitments, the movie, that was your your story, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her story, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, do tell us a little bit more about the band. How did you guys form? Um, oh, what was it like? And tell us more about yourself during that time. So, okay. tell us about how you viewed the world and what was your perspective on life at the time. So there was me, my brothers, and their wives, and and two or three friends that we grew up in the neighbourhood. So we we grew up on the north side of the city and uh, grew from a really tough neighborhood, uh, probably one of the toughest neighborhoods in Dublin City. And uh, so my brothers were boxers, and uh, they st stopped boxing when they were about 17, 18. And so they won a lot of competitions and national level and stuff like that. So we went to see a band called UB40. Do you remember that band? They're still around slightly. Well, they were in the 80s and 90s anyway. And uh, so we went to see them one night in, I think it was the RDS. I think it wasn't the RDS Downs. And he's down that way anyway. And uh, so my brother Joe, he had a great voice. And he decided, let's put this band together. So we we couldn't play an instrument. We've never, most of us had left school very early. So none of us had ever tried anything. So Joe put the band together. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, now with nowhere, you know, my brother George, he took up the saxophone, Joe took up the guitar, Paul took up the drums. And, and so it was very similar to the story, you know, almost identical to the commitment story. And, uh, you know, Northside Band and uh, Rough Band. And, uh, you know, so, yeah. And then all of a sudden, now nowhere, we, we, at that time in the 80s, um, the band scene was massive, huge in Dublin City. I think there was over 3,000 bands playing around the city at the time. And uh, so there was Aslan and U2 had just made it. And so we were sort of around that on that scene at the time. And uh, we were a little bit different at the time. We were an eight piece, we had a brass section and uh, we were a soul funk band and we, we wrote all our own songs. We didn't do, we didn't do any covers. And uh, so we released a couple of singles and they, they they went very very far and did very well in the charts and 
And then out of nowhere, Louis Walsh, you know Louis Walsh out of um, X Factor? Yeah, well, Louis was our tour manager at the time. And uh, so Louis looked after all our gigs. And so we toured the length and breadth of Ireland. And then out of nowhere, then Alan Parker came into Dublin City and he wanted to put this movie together called The Commitments, a book by Roddy Doyle. Now, not many people know this part, but years before that, my brother Joe got a phone call from a PR lady to meet him in Lombard Street and go for a drink and to ask him to tell, tell her all about the story of the band. And at that point, we were, we'd were been on TV and we were, we were very successful at that point. And uh, so Joe met this lady with the guitar player, Ken McCluskey, who eventually was in the movie. Ken was one of the key um, um, players in the movie. He was the bass player in the commitments, actually, in the movie itself. So Je Joe and Ken met this girl. And anyway, they sat there all day drinking and shared a whole story with this lady, how it all began, all up to that point. I never saw her again. I wonder what was that all about. And it turns out year, about two years later, that we were at the premiere of the commitments and uh, there was Roddy Doyle's wife. That's who the PR gear was. And so Joe confronted her and confronted Roddy Doyle and he basically said it wasn't based on our story, but it's identical to our story from beginning to end. So, uh, so that, that's what happened. And during the commitments, we became even more famous and we were on TV, we were on American TV and, yeah, we were destined to be probably one of the biggest bands to come out of Ireland just after you two, but a lot of things happened, and then out of nowhere, seven of us got saved in the band. So my brother George, saxophone player, he got saved first, and then he led us all to the Lord over a period of about 18 months. So things altered at then at that point to change, and we were supposed to sign the EMI, and that fell apart, and a lot of things happened, you know, as it does in bands. And uh, so up to that, yeah, so that, that's what happened. So, yeah, we were we were on TV and uh, had hit records and destined for the big time, but God had a different plan. I suppose being in the band would have saved me and my brothers from a life of crime. Because at that point, most of our friends growing up in the neighborhood became part of the uh, gangs and crime, serious crime. So... I always say that the band days, even though they were full of stuff, probably protected us from a lot of stuff and gave us a different perspective at the time. And uh, so, yeah, so uh, I think it was God's grace. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about how you guys got saved. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that in a, in a moment. But you obviously come from a very musical family. You guys obviously had a natural flair for it. I don't know. I mean, you know, music, I suppose, you can have a natural flair, but you also have to put a bit of work into it as well. So I was a brilliant songwriter and uh, he had a beautiful voice. And uh, so I think, you know, Joe did very well. Out of all of us, Joe did the best out of school, would you believe? He won scholarships and everything. But uh, but I think he had great ability. And uh, so for me, I probably didn't have great music ability, but I put in the effort. And so I went to the Royal Academy of Music and everything and studied trumpet there, music there. Where did you get your work ethic from? Was it something you got had instilled from your parents? Or? I, th I think, to be honest with you, for me, is it just me personally? I think for me, I had this sort of mindset growing up. I wanted to get out of the neighborhood and I wanted to have a good life and a successful life to some degree. Now, I left school very early. I didn't do very well in school. But I think we just wanted to be famous. So we were willing to do anything and everything to be famous. And to have big cars and big houses and loads of money. But, uh, yeah, I think that's... And I suppose, we, you know, what we did was we were clever because we never gave up our jobs. So we would work all day and then gig all night. And then, you know, weekends... You know, I remember many times we'd drop Paul off at the super, uh, off at the fruit market at five. We'd be coming back from a gig from Cork. And in them days, there was no motorways. And, and then I'd go home, have an hour's sleep and get up and go into the barber shop and work all day and then get picked up at night off we go again but we enjoyed it it was great crack as well do you know what I mean I guess the the drive for the band to be successful kept, kept you guys going yeah because we we ended up you know at that point you know magazines were writing about us newspapers were writing about us we were invited on the tv shows and like all of a sudden things just began to happen and the music like we were good like the stuff was good and uh 
it was it was very popular. So I mean, most of our gigs were jammed. I remember doing one gig in the Phoenix Park, eighty five thousand people. So you know, coming off that that sort of feeling, it, it gave you a drive to continue to feel that feeling. Do you know what I mean? And when you're young, you can sort of pull it off. I was only and I was only eighteen, nineteen. I was full of life and full of energy, and you know. Talking about being 18 and 19 and full of energy, you were actually a really good football player as well. Yeah, we, we were, me and my brothers, we, we were good at sports. My brothers were extraordinary boxers and uh, I was very good at soccer and uh, played for Home Farm. And uh, ended up when I was 15 playing at the top, uh, winning cups and trophies and had huge potential, but had uh, scouts from the UK looking at me, but at the age of 15, I, I took a wrong path in my life that would alter everything and change everything. And um, never played again, would you believe, until I went to Bible school. And uh, sadly, I wish I would have continued playing soccer. Even if I hadn't have made it, it would have been a good interest to me in my often. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I had ability as, you know, yeah, sort of, yeah. <laughs> I've heard a story that um, apparently, you, you, as you said, you had scouts from the UK. And um, did you have somebody who was going to scout you the next morning and you fell asleep? <laughs> no, what happened was um, we won the Conway Cup and we were playing. I was, I was playing against the internet, yeah, guys that were playing for Ireland and stuff like that. And the Man United scout was there the day watching me. And the next day I started to drink and that was it. That was it. I never, never played again, which is sad, really. You know, who knows where I would have been? But then again, God, God knows everything. You know what I mean? So okay. that's it. That's it. And speaking of where you are today, let's yeah. go back to what happened. So, what got you out of that? What made you stop drinking? And tell us more about being saved. Well, what happened was my brother George, as he said, at the band saxophone player, he got saved. And, uh, he, he went from madness to talking to Jesus all the time. Yes. And uh, I, I thought, this fellow has, like, um, yeah. was, Did the whole family think that as well? Did everybody yeah, because we, we, my mother and my father, especially, was a, and still is a strong Catholic. So, yeah. And um, we came from a Catholic upbringing. So, we never really went to Mass and stuff. But, um, yeah, I mean, at that time in the 80s, I mean, late 80s, early 90s, it, it, was, it was unheard of in Ireland and Dublin mm -hmm. City. So, you know, so for us, I, I'm a first generation Christian. So when we were to get saved, it was a bit odd and a bit strange. And talking about Jesus all the time, we thought like we literally lost the plot completely. But what happened to me was um, I was going to Tenerife one year with a friend of mine, a mate of mine. And uh, so George said, I'll give you a Bible to take with you. So I laughed. I said, yeah, Bible, you know. So I took the Bible through it in my bag and... Uh, I left it there and I didn't take for some reason I ended up in my bag gonna help and uh, got all the way to Spain. So so we're in Tenerife and uh, drinking and partying as you do and you know all types of things that you shouldn't do. And uh woke up one morning uh, in someone else's apartment and uh, went into the bathroom and by the time I came out of the bathroom I was saved. What happened in the bathroom? So <laughs> It was like a road, it's like Acts chapter 9, Paul and the Damascus Road, you know. I had this incredible experience that I couldn't understand. I didn't have the language to explain at the time was this sense of conviction and what I was doing and how I was living was wrong. And I remember coming out of the bathroom, speaking to someone in another room saying, you know, this is not right before God, all this that we're doing here is wrong. Now, two days prior to that, I mean, those thoughts had, never entered my mind so i left that apartment i went back to my apartment sat at the pool and my head was melted didn't yeah. know what had happened didn't fully understand it but right through the end of the two weeks i was drinking and just couldn't feel what i used to always feel and so i came back to uh dublin and i went down to my brother george and i told him the story what happened to him yeah. what happened to me and he said you know, you need to get on your knees now, I'll give your life to Christ, and say this prayer. So I got on my knees and didn't know what I was doing, to be honest, and uh, accepted Christ into my heart. And uh, now, I'll be honest, I had no role to the mask experience that night. Mm -hmm. but the next morning, I knew I was born again. No doubt about it. Still remember to this day, 30 years later. I remember going into town, going to work, 
getting on the bus and in, in Dublin City on the north side, the famous area, the language is, 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 is beyond anything you've heard in your life. Mm-hmm. So I remember going upstairs, listening to all that and saying, no, I can't listen to that stuff. I went downstairs and sat downstairs. And all of a sudden, I started looking at the clouds in the sky. And, and at that time, I took up running. I did a lot of running in them days. I go out for runs and stuff and look at the squirrels in the Phoenix Park. I, I literally thought I was having a breakdown. But I knew something was happening. Mm-hmm. I couldn't fully understand it. And I hadn't been to church. So at that point, my brother used to have a cell group in his house in Fingers and most Mondays, there'd be 30, 40 people there, all extra that, like gangland members, and all getting saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so I used to attend that meeting, and uh, God would meet with us in a supernatural way. Like, yeah. even the crime rate at that point went down in the neighborhood and everything. Yeah. Like, it was a revival, really. It was extraordinary. People were getting saved everywhere. Yeah. Families were getting saved. Gangs were getting saved. It was extraordinary. So that's what happened. And uh, that was the beginning of the change in my life, really, you know? Yeah. Uh, that, was, that was the moment that I was 23, nearly 24, and God decided to step into my world at that point. Yeah, that's brilliant. And how did you meet your wife? When did she oh. come along in the story? My lovely wife, she's out there somewhere. And uh, so I met Shan, I was in Bible school, so I ended up going to Bible school. I was 26, and I did two years in Dublin, and then I went to Belgium for two years to do my bachelor's degree. And uh, so one summer I had to come back and work in the barbershop, but also walk alongside the church. And so we decided to do an outreach. The church and Sham was leading the outreach into the flats of the back at um, St. Mark's Church. And that's where I met her, connected with her there. And she didn't really want to connect with me, but uh, that's where I connected with her. And that's where we got to know each other that summer, yeah, a little bit. You know, she was running the other direction. I was running after her in that direction. So, um, yeah, 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 that's where I met her, yeah. Daughters, beautiful daughters. What's it like being the, uh, the only guy in it? No, it's uh, great. Uh, the Lord knew to give me girls because, you know, because yeah. of my sort of background stuff. So yeah. I think the Lord knew that to have girls was a way to soften me, yeah. smooth me over, Bev, you know, smooth, smooth the hard rock, you know, make it well, soft. You know? <laughs> absolutely. They're the yeah. joy of my life. You know? Fantastic. Absolute joy of my life. And so, talking about family, you have a, a wonderful church family as well. Yeah. Um, I yeah. visited your church. It's it's brilliant. There's, you can just feel the love, and you can feel yeah, yeah. the acceptance yeah, when you go in, and everyone's always happy, like yourself. Like I've never seen you <laughs> seen you in a bad mood before. Um, and it's it's very uh, ethnically diverse as well, which yeah, is great. Yeah. Um, I know when I went, I saw people from like African backgrounds, uh, Irish people, Indian people. What what do you think it is that makes all these people from different backgrounds come together. Well, I think it's one or two things. I remember years and years ago being a Bible school, and uh, the Bible school I was in Belgium was diverse. Like it was people from seventy-five countries around the world, mm-hmm. and so I think there is a scripture verse that does say. Now I don't know whether you'd agree with this, right? But that's okay. It says a prophet has no honor in his own hometown, and so I think sometimes when you come from a, the, the neighborhood of the city, I think. People don't tend to, you know, because you're from the same, you know, mm-hmm. same country, yeah. same culture. I think sometimes God allows other cultures to come in for you to yeah, have a have a more diverse um, um, position. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, the Bible does tell us that in heaven there's every na- nation, every color, uh, all over the globe in heaven. So, I think for me, the church that I see today that we have. Is a picture, a small picture of heaven, yeah. with different cultures, with different backgrounds, and different people with different stories. And I embrace that. I love it. I think it's great. As an Irishman, I love it. And you know, Dublin City is not like it was in the eighties. No. Now, when I grew up, there, were, there was very few ethnic people. I mean, there was very few coloured people in my neighbourhood. We never saw a coloured person. So, you know, I think, I think God, in His wisdom, knows what He's doing. So, Dublin City is a vibrant city, and it's full yeah. of people from all around the world. So. So it's great to have some some glimpse of what heaven is like in the church, and we embrace each other, and we all, you know, we love each other, and we accept each other's differences, and that's great. Yeah, and we've got one common goal, and that's Christ. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely, that's beautiful. No, I yeah. agree with you. It makes it makes a lot of sense. And yeah. isn't our God so amazing and so fun to make everybody yeah. so diverse? 
Because imagine yeah. if people were all the same, how boring it would be. Yeah, it'd be boring. And I, I mean, I like Indian food, so that helps with it. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, uh, you seem to like India quite a lot. You and your families. And yes. You, you, you've been there a few times on missions. So tell us a little bit about the David Ware Trust and, and the good okay. work you're doing through it. Well, I, I went to India 16 years ago. Um, my wife, Shan, she was in a meeting years and years ago. And a girl had just come back from India and she was involved in Teen Challenge. I don't know whether you know Teen Challenge. Well, Teen Challenge is a rescue center for people from drug addiction and all the rest. But there's a massive one in Bombay. Pastor Devaraj runs it. It's the biggest Teen Challenge center in the world. Helps girls who are caught being trafficked and stuff like that. So this girl had been there and she shared the story of how girls were being trafficked. And she came back and at that point, we were only married and Rachel think it was about a year and a half. And so it would cost a thousand euro or a thousand pound at the time to rescue a girl. So Shan came back and said, and she couldn't sleep all night. And she said, we've got to give our savings away. And I said, I said yeah, we've only got two grand. So, so what do you want to do? So she said, why don't we try and rescue two girls? And I said, okay, let's give all our savings away. So we decided to give all our savings. And I said, you know, I'll run a, I'll run a marathon to try and raise money to rescue girls. And I cut a long story short, I went that year on a trip, and then the following year I went and I rescued 11 girls who were, who were, in, who were being enslaved in a prostitution area in a place called, um, the country now, it was in South India, and um, Tenali, Andhra Pradesh. So went and did that. And then the following year, we were only a tiny church at that point, and we supported an orphanage Oh, I think 30 kids. So we paid seven and a half thousand a year. And then the Lord spoke and said, I want you to go to India because I want you to do something yourself. So the third year I went on my own. I traveled all over, extensively over South India, from Guntur to Gudalur to Titukarin, everywhere. And I ended up in a place called Velour. And I met a wonderful gentleman, Mr. Sam, who passed away last year. And uh, we had dinner together. He said, what do you want to do, Pastor? I said, I want to help the poor. And so we started with educating one child and educating too, and, and so it went on. So for the last 10 years, the David Ware Trust has has built playgrounds, has, uh, looking after 475 children in two orphanages. I mean, we work with other people with leprosy, and so it is our passion, and uh, our, I think it's a God-given thing, to be honest, you know what I mean? It is a God-given thing. So my kids come out every year, we do a mission trip, and my two daughters come and Chang, we go out with 15, 16 people. And this year we've taken on the biggest project ever. We've decided to build houses for a place called Shanti Branham in Below. It's a place where people with leprosy have no places to live. And we live in this place. And when we were there last year, I said to Shanti, the buildings are crumbling. So we've taken on by faith to raise money to refurbish six and build eight. You won't believe it. This year with COVID-19, we have raised more money than we've ever raised in all the years. So six houses start to be built next week, would you believe? And we've, and we've just refurbished six. So, but also this year we've helped, we have funded four, 30, 30 children in, in Africa to be educated for a year. We've also fed a feeding program in the Philippines. So yeah, so the David Ware Trust is beginning to expand a little bit into different nations. But India at the moment is our is our baby, our heart. That's where our heart is. Yeah. That's wonderful. And going back to the eleven girls that you saved, um, yes. what was that like? Because I can only imagine. But t tell us a little bit more about that because it it gets really real and it gets very very difficult, and you need a particular heart for that. You know, I didn't touch on it today, and I probably won't touch on it, but I came from a very involved background when I was younger and stuff like that, you know? And uh, I remember Shannon saying that God was going to restore all that back to me. And so when I heard about this situation, I thought, oh, this is awful. And so I ran the Dublin City Market, and money came, literally money was coming through my door. It was extraordinary. I'll never forget. So when I got to Andhra Pradesh, and... So on the day, they said, we're going to take you into the Red Light District area. And I thought, Jay, this is going to be really, Jay, what's this going to be feeling? Like? And I remember walking in and thinking, I remember looking at the paint, you know. I won't explain what I was thinking, but gosh, it's so dark. And I walked in, and the 11 girls were there. And they all came around, 
And I held her hands and I literally took them all out one by one and brought them out. It was the most extraordinary, incredible feeling I've ever felt in my life. But what happened was, Bev, which was I'll never forget. I'd say I'll see that picture when I get to, when I go into eternity. That night then we had a celebration service on the top of a building. And they asked me to pray for the girls. Where I didn't know each girl had a dove in their hand. So when I said, Lord, I just pray and I say, Lord, I release them in Jesus' name. He threw the doves in the air, the 11 girls. And the doves circled for five minutes. And I wept and I wept and I wept. I'll never forget it. It was the most extraordinary feeling. And that has never left me for India. And hopefully next year we have been asked to take on a new project in Valor of setting up a rescue centre. Now it's going to cost 750 euro a month, but you know I believe God will supply that need. Absolutely. And for anyone who's listening today and watching this, um, who uh, who would be interested and would want to support uh, the David Ware Trust. Where can we go to do that? Well, if you go onto the David Ware Trust or onto our website or onto our Facebook page and contact us there, uh, if you want to help in any way, we'd love to hear from you. And if you're interested in coming on one of our trips, we'd love you to come along and, and see the work first hand. You'll see exactly what we do and, and, and how wonderful it is helping people and helping kids. I mean, I think yesterday we paid for 125 presents for 125 children yesterday. Beautiful. That's yeah. wonderful. Absolutely. What I'll do is I'll put a link in the video description. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be super. And, um, you guys can just go there and, and check it out. Fantastic. Have you picked up much Hindi on your on your travels to India? Yeah, not Hindi. I speak a little bit of, uh, yeah, what's it called? It's a little bit of Indian language. It's Tamil. You know, Thai, oh, okay. Uh, Very yeah, cool. in the King of La. Very nice. <laughs> your, your background is Pakistani, but you're from yeah, Pakistan. Yeah, so my mom yeah. is Pakistani uh, and Urdu and Hindi, they're pretty oh, similar. Okay. Um, but my dad has a Tamil background. He's Sri okay. Lankan. Yeah. You like it? Oh, very good. Yeah. Wow. I've been asked to go to Pakistan once and I've been asked to go to Bangladesh. So, so we'll see how it goes. Absolutely. <laughs> you have to be strong to go to those places. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I know we're all hoping for COVID to, to settle down oh, so we please. can do these, these great things. Um, but for anyone who's watching today and they're just feeling the strain a bit too much because by the time this video comes out, we'll be back into level five lockdown and it just seems to be going on and on. What's your advice to those watching? How are you guys coping with it? What's, yeah, what's so what we did was we decided to do a few things differently. So mm -hmm. we all in the house took up exercise, walking Excellent. every day and eating properly. My wife has lost nearly four stone. Wow. Um, so we've all lost weight and we took up an exercise program and then we did a clever thing. Shan said, why don't we now, rather than eating chocolate and all this stuff. Yeah. So we do a lockdown, it's called lockdown shop. So every night you're allowed one tiny piece of chocolate and one pack of crisps and whatever. Watch a bit of TV. So that's one of the things that we've done, which has been really good for us actually. Stops you munching and crunching through everything. And then I've decided to have a different perspective. So your mind is the most powerful thing on the planet. Right, it's the most powerful thing. Not not Apple computers, not anything like that. The most powerful thing on the planet is this thing here. Oh, here we created all this. So I say to everybody, when you look out the window, you have a choice what way you see things and how you approach things. And so I get up every day and I say, it's going to be a great day. It's going to be a great day. Go for a walk every day, do my prayer time, I read my scriptures, do all I always have always done. But you know, when you have a different mindset, it helps. Because we're hearing so much about mental health. and Because years ago, Bev, I'll tell you this quick story was, God spoke to me very clearly years and years ago. I was born again, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and still struggling with lots of stuff. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I can never change the way you think. That's up to you. And I realized at that point, every thought that comes into my mind, I have a choice. How I view that thought, what I do with that thought, and how I live according to that thought. And so years and years ago, I decided to change my whole perspective. And as you said, Aidan, you're always in good form. It's very rare I'm in bad form. Even with my mum passing, I decide every day to think much better, much clearer, and have a, have, a, have a very positive approach. You know, Jesus said, or Paul says in the scripture, the Proverbs says, as a man thinketh, therefore he is. So how you see yourself, 
who determined the outcome of your life. I have an old friend of mine, Dr. Dr. Sam, used to say, the words you say create the atmosphere you live in. Absolutely. Right out of that to one day. Thoughts you think brings the words that you say, it creates the words you live in. Yeah. So I decided years ago, because I came from a very difficult background, that my home life would not be a home life of one negative thought, one negative feeling in the house. Keep it sweet, keep it positive, and keep it upbeat. So I say to everybody that's going through this situation, change your perspective. Maybe COVID has pushed you to change your way, the way you see things, the way you view things. And God is in control of everything. At the end of the day, God knows what he's doing. So our church has probably, this has been the best year of our church. Honestly, best year of our church. Young adults, every Thursday, everyone's there. Youth, kids, missions, services every Sunday. It has been the best year of our, of our church life. And we have connected with every single member every week to make sure they're all doing well. We've dropped off food packages and whatever the kids stuff are. So I'm trying to say, say to people, it's how we view it and it's how we approach it and it's how we live now will determine what we'll be like when we get out. Not when we see, we're all saying when we get out, we're going to be different. No, no, it's how we are now will determine how different we are when we get outside the door. So, you know, it's like Corey Tambun, the great woman, you know, she was a wonderful, wonderful Christian lady who was in Belson and was in Auschwitz. And she said, you know, she said, no, no, no pit is too deep or too dark for God to reach into. Wow. And so she saw her own sister being being beaten to death there. And one day there was fleas everywhere in the in the room, yeah. and all the women were complaining. And she said, "Stop complaining. The very fact that the fleas are in here, the SES soldiers won't come into the room, so we can have our Bible studies." So she sort of had this mindset: everything that happens has a reason, has a purpose. Yeah. So embrace it from God's perspective. And so that's what I've always done, and that's why I always encourage people: and stop thinking like that. Thinking, thinking, doesn't do, do, do you any good or anyone else around you. Yeah. Have a positive mindset. Absolutely. It's that renewing of our mind that oh, the scripture absolutely. talks about. And to be joyful and give thanks always. Absolutely. And that's a choice. Everything's a choice, Beth. Everything. Yeah. You know, Paul says, again, again, I say rejoice. He wrote those words from a prison cell. Mm. And it wasn't a prison cell like we have today. Do you know what I mean? No, it was, it was yeah. Pretty, I can imagine. Dark and, very dark and lonely and cold. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, he says, rejoice. And you know, when Paul and Saul are in the prison, you know, you have a choice there, and you begin to sing unto the Lord and begin to pray. So they, they, they made the decision in their mind. You know what? We're not going to allow this to torture us. We're going to actually change the situation. Yeah. So the mind is the most powerful thing that God has ever created. It really is. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, words of wisdom. Thank you uh, there so we much, go. guys. Do go ahead and check out more of the Maybe Blair Trust. I will put a link for that in the video description below. Thank yeah, you yeah. so much, Master Pat. No problem, Ben. Anytime.